most of the investors they don't care about being stable, and and, and that's a very good uh, point that you that you highlighted. Stable companies they tend not to die, and uh, when you have a portfolio that don't die, you have a better return. I, I try to to get a very simplistic way of doing things, not simplistic but simple way of doing things. And uh, one thing that I always tell my 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 entrepreneurs is that don't die, you know. So you you gotta receive your money, but I try to to build a company out of that and not a, only an idea. Welcome, everyone. Today, we'll be talking with Eduardo Cooper, someone who's done it all, consultant at McKinsey, investment banker at Credit Suisse, founder, corporate VC, angel investor, what else? Something else. Eduardo is now the founding partner of Airborne Ventures, an early stage VC fund looking to help founders fly to their dreams. Based in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Eduardo has been investing in tech startups for almost 10 years. He was previously the managing partner of Innovavera Ventures, the corporate VC of Banco Bradesco, one of the leading banks in this country. Eduardo is a Wharton MBA, and we recently met in the Global Forum in Sao Paulo. He has also been participating actively in our programming at Draper House in Rio de Janeiro, where we're going to see him soon for our first program there. Edu, welcome to Startup Sounds. It's great to have you here. And uh, is there anything else you, you would like to add as, as as way of intro? Hi, Nacho. Thanks for having me. Yes, there's a few things that I could put over here. Um, but actually, I think you put a very good summary. I would only add that I have a twins while I was uh, founding a company and I survived. It's a pretty good accomplishment. <laughs> but uh, jokes apart, I began my career. Uh, in the Brazilian Air Force in Brazil, I was training to become an airplane pilot for the Air Force. So unfortunately, it didn't go well or I didn't finish the course, but that's how airborne you know, origin uh, took place um, after those years. So it's your way of fulfilling that dream of, of flying for, for, the, for the Army? Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's a, it's a way to help others achieve their dreams. Amazing. Edu, um, let's talk a little bit about Airborne uh, Ventures. Uh, what do you think is kind of like a differential of the fund, of yourself as an investor maybe as well, uh, compared to other funds uh, in, in, in the region or, or in Brazil? Okay, absolutely. Um, Airborne is, Ventures is all about helping Brazilian B2B startups soar. Uh, our mission is to transform those early stage companies into scalable, stable businesses. Uh, focusing especially on productivity and financial innovation. Uh, what set us apart is a combination of our deep investment expertise, uh, a little bit of our industry operator, we've been, as you said, we've been all, all over the place, and also our extensive in, um, local network. We manage over 200 million USD across multiple funds. So Airborne is not the first fund we manage. However, it's the second fund within the, the new franchise Airborne. And we executed more than 70 deals uh, from uh, ranging from Series C to Series C in, in Brazil and the US and one of them in Latin as well. And we had successfully exited uh, three times already, uh, two NASDAQ IPOs and uh, one sale to a competitor. And with the, with the, one of those NASDAQ uh, companies, we achieved a 10 times multiple under two years. So it was a very good IRR and DPI for the fund. At the time, we had a, a hundred million AIs fund, and this company returned uh, the whole fund in less than two years. And another company that went very well, we had uh, thirty-five times uh, invested uh, Moik over multiple over invested capital, and this company uh, we we should have exit on the IPO, right? So that's uh, that's one things that one thing that we we learned three times, 34, uh, 35 times is pretty good. So that's one is uh, of another fund bagger that we have. And the company that we, we ended up sending to our, uh, sell, um, selling to our competitor is a company that we sold for over a billion AIs uh, in 2021. So it's a company we built from scratch. So it, that was on my venture builder days. <laughs> A billion reais is around two hundred million dollars for for yes. people, yeah, to understand and scale this. Uh, you said scalable, but you also said stable. I think you said stable. Uh, what do you mean with with stable? Like, what's the why? Why do you use this word? And and why do you think you know you should build a portfolio or companies that are stable? 
yeah, well, most of the investors they don't care about being stable, and 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 that's a very good uh, point that you that you highlighted. Stable companies they tend not to die, and uh, when you have a portfolio that don't die, you have a better return. I, I try to to get a very simplistic way of doing things, not simplistic but simple way of doing things. And uh, one thing that I always tell my 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 entrepreneurs is that don't die. You know, so you, you got to receive your money, but uh, try to to build a company out of that and not a, only an idea. Uh, this is a different approach. Not every company fits that, you know, that thesis. And, and that's OK. Um, I think that some people prefer to chase on a more uh, bleed scaling kind of company. We also like companies that grow fast, but we prefer companies that grow fast and stable. And sometimes you take a hit on on growth to to make it more stable. But uh, just like airplanes, when you're flying, it's better for you to make sure you can land rather than you know just realize that your fuel has uh, gone out in the middle of the flight. That's funny. Very recently, I, I ran out of fuel on on the road. Actually, like two weeks ago, uh, <laughs> it's not nice. So if you're a founder, <laughs> don't run out of gas. Um, it'll uh, you've you've been an angel investor. You've been in corporate VC. You're, you've been you, you've been a fund manager as well as, as an independent VC in a sense. How how have you transitioned between those hats, and how how similar, how different are those different you know uh, roles that you've taken, and and what have you learned from each maybe as well? Well, uh, I remember when I started being an entrepreneur back in the day, it was 2014-ish. And uh, I thought that, you know, the first time you fundraise and then you fundraise from, uh, in my case, I was fundraising with VCs and um, other kind of uh, investors. And that was really tough. And I, and, I, and I learned that some of them also had a, a tough time talking to us because there are some similarities uh, on, on the way. And then I was talking to a friend that uh, I actually ended up investing in 2017. And he told me that, um, or maybe earlier than that, I don't remember very well. Um, but he said that invest, being an investor, a VC investor, and being a tech entrepreneur, it's uh, actually this, the two different sides of the same coin. So in the end of the day, the, one needs the other one. And uh, so the relationship, they must be balanced. and. Uh, that that's that's when I started to to understand a little bit about how to transition from entrepreneur to an investor. And uh, another thing that uh, he uh, he he was an investor before being entrepreneur, so he was doing the other way around. I was helping him uh, with the entrepreneurship, and he was helping me with the investor side. And uh, another thing that he he told me, and um, that that I took took it straight to my heart, is that. Before you make money for yourself, you gotta make money from for the other ones. That that's kind of a a good mantra you might have if you are an investor of third party money, because you should not look for you before you look for the the guys you are bringing aboard. So that that's uh, something that uh, that I realize. And uh, as an entrepreneur, sometimes you make make it the same way, or sometimes the company goes well and the investor doesn't feel like uh, it went well, or it has different outcomes, but the, the the main idea here is how you you actually make sure that uh, that the interests are aligned, and when you make money, the other ones make money as well. So everybody are happy together, or they are not happy together, but for the right reasons. If you misalign that, uh, you could be happy, but you know the the, the relationship goes goes to waste. Amazing. You, you said, you know, in this idea of like two sides of the same coin, uh, you said that you have to try to maintain an equilibrium. How, how do you how do you keep that equilibrium uh, between investor and entrepreneur? Um... As a, the good the good part of being entrepreneur before doing uh, doing investing is that you you know a lot of uh, leverage or levers that you can pull and push that you you you'll be able to make money for yourself as entrepreneur but out of the investor's money. And that's not nice, but you know how to do that. Uh, but the thing, when you become investor and you know how they can siphon out money and just, you know, sustain a lifestyle 
with your money or something like that. They are not trying to build and add value. <laughs> Sorry. They, you actually realize that uh, you, you you can do a better diligence and, and make sure that you're teaming up with the right person or right, you know, right team. So that's the idea. And uh, uh, that, that that's a little bit how you do it. You understand the other the other uh, part motives and uh, reasons for backing you up. So that's pretty much make sure that uh, you don't eat the cake alone or they eat the cake alone. Yeah. And, and then you also said that, that as an investor, you have to make sure that you make money for the rest. And, and you mentioned the, your investors or the, or the LPs. Does that include the entrepreneur as well? Like trying to, to make the, the entrepreneur make money and, and, and see success at the end of the road? Of course it does, uh, because as an investor, it's a loop. OK, so uh, if, if you look at the, the investing cycle, so today you are you are the entrepreneur. Later on, you become the VC because you have an exit or have a, you know access or whatever combination of that. And then you start investing your own money or you no know, third party money. So that that's the thing. You use a network to invest to, to invest. But if you actually do your job right, what happens to your entrepreneur? They will become uh, wealthy as well. And then they will become your LPs. So do no wrong, do no harm to everyone involved. It's really critical because that flywheel keep, you know, uh, the, the, the feeding loop. So they, they kept, you know, um, this feedback loop and make sure that uh, your, your LPs become your entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs become LP. Things things happen about that a lot. I have a, a few uh, a few invested uh, investees, so entrepreneurs that they are on the second or their third gig, and they make money on the the previous one. So they are also my LP. And there are some LPs who, when I met them, they were just my LPs, but now they decided they want to do something again. And so they, I, I always have I have the pleasure to work with them again. So that's really nice. Um, a way of uh, taking care of uh, everyone involved. It's it's a it's a long term game with long term people, as I think Naval says. Right. Yeah, and and again, maybe I I can do another parallel with the with the uh, with the Air Force because uh, I was talking to a friend this morning and uh, explaining how I or why I do trust my friends or, or my, my my brothers from uh, from the Air Force. And they say that we've been through a lot together, and uh, that's similar way of thinking with your entrepreneurs, and that uh, that fosters your esprit du corps, que, um, which means that um, uh, you know this uh, this collectivity spirit. So you you know that someone is taking care of you, and you're taking care of someone on the same side. So you actually, if you if you if you take that one one step above. You know that your entrepreneurs they will take care of you as an investor same way as you as investor are gonna take care of them as entrepreneur so that's really that's a, a, re, a really good uh good place to be in, really really good community to be in that's an interesting idea like an idea of brotherhood or sisterhood uh, depending yeah. on who, who it is and and how do you find that or how do you realize when co-founders have that uh, between them when they when you know you meet them you chat a little bit and how do you realize that there's that sense of i'm gonna be here for you uh between them right you know? mm -hmm. uh th there's a lot of things that you, you can actually interview them and ask a few questions that you, you can understand but in the end of the day you have to under uh, understand their real you know motives what the real reasons for doing what they're doing so that's starting to, to understand. And also, when you start talking about, you know, uh, there's perspectives on over life, for example, it, it, seem, it seems silly, but uh, I remember I was in a, uh, this last uh, Brazil week in New York with uh, a table with lots of entrepreneurs and, and, and VCs. And then I started talking with uh, one, uh, one entrepreneur. I, I knew him already, but, you know, just like from, hey, bye, for something for a little bit more uh, cold. But since we sat, you know, beside in the table, we started talking and then I, I started looking to the things that he'd done in the past, 
the way he treats his clients, the way he treats his investors, or you know, the kind of uh, things that he did while he was in the MBA. We did MBA about the same time, uh, different schools, but uh, at the same time. Uh, and then we realized that this guy has more uh, in common than it looks like. So in the end of the day, you can start a relationship there. So that's the first point. And after that, that second point, you start looking, hey, I'm going to do this, this, this for you. Is that fine? And you, you see that people start, you know, evolving the conversation. Uh, of course, there are some things that you just like a, a, a marriage, you just uh, realize or just you just get to know it when it happens. But, you know, that's kind of a risk that you have to take. Amazing. Amazing. Um you 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 were an entrepreneur before right and and i and i and i wonder what specific levers or, or challenges or lessons from that experience you you've leveraged as an investor uh trying to find specific things more than you know like operating experience you know like is there any any particular thing which you say like okay like i know this or i understand this because i operated a company and ran a company well, yes, that, that's well, the first thing that I always I talk, I always talk to them is that, hey, uh, look, sometimes I might urge doing something or saying you to do something because I have done that in the past and it worked. But we gotta we gotta actually understand that this the, the the setups are different, and sometimes whatever you did in the past is not gonna work now. And so on so forth, or that specific person has a different tool set that he will make the be uh, uh, the same or, or, or a best outcome out of his uh, own knowledge. So what I try to do most of the time is say, hey, look, when I did that or I did something in the past and I was so successful because this, this and that. And the reasons I believe I was successful was one, two and three and four. So I try to make it more uh, a process, a thought process, rather than you know saying something that they know. And of course, I will uh, try to outline every every kind of uh, uh, reason be behind me or the you know the, the negotiating part and everything, because it changes. For example, if you're if you're negotiating with a with a vendor that doesn't have the same you know uh, same structure or the same um, incentives that the one you did in the past, the outcome could be different or, you know, the negotiation could be different. So it's more like, you know, a, a fast track MBA where you have, you, you go over a case very fast and then give them uh, more, um, more tools for them to, to, to understand the problem. What we miss most is that sometimes we want to do that and, and see for ourselves is that this new strategy is actually working. But, you know, sometimes they, they, they invite us for, for some of those things. For example, most of the times in the companies I invest, I see it on the M&A or finance or corporate finance, whatever committee, because I have done a lot and I have seen a lot. So every single time I, I see something, it just, you know, uh, increases my my hard drive of transactions or of things that I've saw, which actually makes me more, more valuable for this specific position. So that's why I'm always on those positions. And every time I go to that position specifically, I get stronger. So, yeah. So, so you've been there, you've done that. So you have, you have, you know, some, some memory or, or, or that, that you can leverage. And I wonder how much of that can be transmitted. And how much just has to be experienced by, by the founder and realize it themselves. Uh, and then, then you're like, I told you, or I could have told you I didn't because I, I wanted you to see for yourself, whatever. Does that happen or? Uh, yes, a lot. Well, well, I think the most critical uh, thing is that when should you just stop and say, do this way because this way is not going to end well. <laughs> and then that's something really critical. And then you can be more in incisive and that happens actually a lot quite a lot to be honest and uh but sometimes you just lend you try first you know just lending your experience if that doesn't work you should not have to wait for the company to to go bust 
and then say, hey, I told you, because who's going to win? Who's going to, you know, get something out of it? No one. So if you have to stop, you have to stop. And uh, the person on the other side, entrepreneurs, they must know that you are doing that for the company. And uh, the best way for you to express that you are truly invested on, on, the, on the benefit of the company is when you take a decision that goes against your own uh, benefit, financial benefit. And then they understand. So you're saying that, but that's bad for you. Yes, but it's good for the company. Uh, because some other times you're going to say something that is bad for them as a person or as, an, or as an executive, but it's actually good for a person, for, for the company. I'm sorry. So in the end of the day, you have to show them that that's the, the best part. Okay. So, so you seem to be a very hands-on, you know, like, you know, but there's some other investors that they just like invest and kind of wait. They go to the board meetings, give a couple of suggestions and that's it. But you see it on the, on the corporate finance, whatever committee in the MA committee, you get involved, you make suggestions a little bit harder. Is that, is that, is that your, your, the way you operate the fund? Yeah, yes, exactly. That's that's the way I, I like to do things, but not every company needs this. For example, if you're talking with a Series B company or if the company has a lot of things, you just change your role and then you become a sounding board. And exactly like I said, you go to meetings and then you, you understand what's happening and then you give your, your point of view and then you fly away. Because unless you're actually operating, that doesn't really make the difference for you to be there. But, you know, uh, that's also a kind of uh, the company we look for. We don't look for this perfect company because those perfect companies, they are not perfect, first of all. And then uh, whatever is not perfect, you only find out after you did the investment. So you, you have a buyer remorse. And then uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that if, if you enter a company that you know they have a, a weak spot, you know, and you know how to actually fix that weak spot, that's the best position you could be because you, you know what's wrong or, or what, what's not, you know, optimal and you know how to fix that. So that's perfect. So that, that's the, the, the exactly uh, place I like to be. And our investment strategy actually help us by looking for that. For example, there are several very good entrepreneurs that they don't speak in English. So, so and you, you're not going to invest on them. You know, most of the, 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 the Brazilians who actually, and, and Latin Americans in general, who makes lots of money, they don't speak English. So if you take this out of your equation, you're taking a lot of companies that could, you know, uh, unlock immense value. So that, that's how we do it. So try, trying to find the, the underdogs in a sense, or, you know, the people who don't have the necessarily the shiny, Stanford MBA or the McKinsey past or whatever, right? Yeah, exactly. So under underdogs and under the radar kind of companies. Uh, uh, that's interesting. Edu, you've been investing for 10 years. Uh, we've, we've mentioned that already, but, uh, but I wonder what, what keeps you interested in, in venture? Uh, why are you, you know, still in it? Uh, what keeps you up at night in a sense and, and makes you, you know, wake up and want to do it again and, and, and check out companies and go to a conference and raise money and, you know, and do all the thing. Oh, yeah. Well, well one, of, one of the things of being an investor that I like a lot is that, is that I surrounded by very interesting people and very smart people. So even though you were in a coffee or you were in a party or, you know, reception or, or whatever, you are surrounded by very interesting and very smart people. And, those the, no, those men and women, they, they know so much and they are very, very, very uh, keen on helping or doing things. And if you are actually drinking water from that fountain, you, you're making myself more smart every day. So that's something that really keeps me going. And, uh, but what, what takes my, what takes my, my sleep? is that sometimes uh, people don't actually see things that are up on their nose. Uh, that's a uh, say, hey, how can not see that happening? Or why would they just fail in this marketing stunt? And because, you know, VC investing has lots of uh, fake it till you make it. 
And uh, sometimes people just don't realize and that's really fake <laughs> and it's still there. So what you're doing there? And other things that are, uh, another thing that takes, uh, takes my sleep is that um, I try to be fair with everyone. So sometimes uh, we put ourselves in a, I would say, fragile or not fragile, but you know, um, a weak position. So you, you could be, you know, that that's a, a position that you, you know, it's not a power position. It's quite the opposite. But, you know, I think it's a part of being humble and, you know, sometimes uh, the other part must be in charge of something, even though they are wrong. And then they, then you can say, hey, and raise, you know, the, the sign saying, I told you so, because you knew that's going to happen and they learn. So hopefully it won't be a final lesson. Uh, you, you can keep your story o over there. But sometimes it, it, it does actually, uh, it does, takes lots of your sleep. And eventually this happens that, that those things happens when the companies are not doing well, or you have this conflict of interest inherently on the contracts and so on and so forth. But if it, if the alignment, the, um, uh, the interests were aligned right on the beginning, those things rare, rarely happen. You mentioned failures and, and hopefully uh, not final failures, but uh, I wonder what what kind of things you have learned from failing in the past. Uh, what, what kind of failures you had and, and what did you learn from those? That, that's a very interesting question that I like a lot. I think that my, my VC career or my investing career is made out of failures because you don't know what's going to do right uh, so what's gonna work in the future you don't know but what you can know and you do know some most of the times is what goes wrong so I, I remember uh, that I have uh, you know every, every time I am talking to someone and they say something that resembles me something that went wrong in the past I know one of my cars start you know glowing in my arm or my chest or something like that I say hey I've seen this in the past and it doesn't end well so, uh, and another thing that I learned is that there's no good partnership with a bad partner. So sometimes I'd rather stick or stay out of some business just because, you know, something there doesn't, doesn't feel right. And then, uh, I've been, uh, does that include hmm? LPs? Does that include LPs or includes everything partnerships with, the you know, with the companies, uh, investing, LPs, uh, employees, everything. So if something is just like, you know, mm, I don't know, I'm not sure about it. You know, you have to respect your gut feeling because you train it, it a lot. And also you have to respect your, your, your rationale, but, uh, your gut feeling, it, it, it process a lot more information than your rational part. So sometimes you just have to trust. And, and, and in, in terms of gut feeling, you've invested in a couple of companies already with Airborne. And I wonder um, if you could bring up like a couple of them or one of them and, and tell kind of like the thought process that went around why you want to invest in that company or, or you know, what made you make that bet? Oh, well, there, there are a few companies that I, that I understood that could be uh could be interesting the one uh one case that i find that's very interesting and everybody uh, i talk about them they like the the idea and the rationale behind it is that a uh, a uh, uh, a well digging company they they look for water in the in, in in the soil under the under the the ground but in the end of the day is a credit company and why is that because you have to actually build you know a, a well uh, electronic wells uh, and everything. They have the uh, you know state of the art tech to do that, and then uh, after the well is positioned, they take water from the ground, and they sell this water for the for the client. And normally the well it's inside the client, so it, you just have you know that you know uh, that uh, brick and mortar project for you to to develop. Of course, all the the technology license you know uh know-how and everything but you've done the, the the water plant and then start selling water for 10 years 
after 10 years, you renew and more 10 years and keeps going, going, going. And most of the contracts are that way. It's um, it's uh, inflation plus kind of contracts. And uh, it's a very interesting uh, project because it also eliminates waste on the, the pipes from the from the reservoir up to the you know the final cons consumer so every liter of water that you consume in the in the the place you install the the water plant saves one liter uh, two liters on, on the reservoir so it's actually really good for for the environment for everything so and this business case it's amazing where, where, is, where is that company operating in in brazil this company operates in Brazil. It's called Nell Water, and uh, but it could operate in other places as well. The only the only part of the the the, the company that is not easily doesn't travel well easily is regulation. Regulation even within you know states and cities in Brazil they change, but people has all the know how how to do it. You could do that in Latin America. You could do that anywhere. Because well, not anywhere. <laughs> you need water under the ground, but. <laughs> And besides that, you can do. Okay. Um, and th there's always like a, a, de a debate. I mean, there's a lot of people that talk about the need to execute and execute and execute. Some more, some other people think a little bit more about strategy and ideation and kind of like planning what you want to do. Um, what's what's the right balance between between those two elements between doing and between thinking? Uh, and when do you know it's time to think and when when it's time to act and do stuff? Uh, it, that's a really good question. When you're talking with us, most of the time is when you invest, you're much more active rather than you have invested over a five years down the road. When you, that investment grows old on your career, what happens is that you have a very important touch points, but you know they tend to be more precise. And uh, because you know the company already. But why I'm saying that? Because in the beginning, when you are talking to the founder or the founding team, like once a week, two times a week, to understand more about the business and do stuff, uh, you sometimes you clearly clearly see that when they are overthinking or overworking something that they have they could have done different. But again, you go back to the beginning of the of our talk, and then you say, hey, on this specific uh scenario i've seen that was the outcomes one two and three and four and it goes back more than you know with the the root mean from a, a advisor uh, you actually give a give them um uh, give them advices and not comments or something like that you make them think it's more like a a, a philosophical uh way of doing things you ask them questions say what's your actually your real north star what do you want to achieve and when you just a small question then when you throw it you understand that some people are trying to do something which the end goal or the you know the the result is not what they are looking for so what do you need right now oh you need a fundraising so why you're doing this this and that which by the way has this positive outcome but it's different from the outcome you are seeking. Look for, look for, do the things that will lead to the outcome you want. And and that sometimes looks silly, but many people don't do it. So it's it's like going on the on the wrong direction, right? Exactly. But uh, it, it's a good direction. Not not not. Don't tell me. Don't 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 get me wrong. But uh, it's not the direction you want to go. So you you wanna you wanna surf? You don't have to go to the mountains, just like that. Unless you're in Rio. Unless you're in Rio, <laughs> which are pretty close. Cool. Um, Edu, you you meet a founder, you meet a, a group of founders, uh, you get to know their startup. What are the the key elements you look for in terms of I don't know traits, personality wise? or characteristics of the industry, the market, or the startup that that make you, you know, make you think, oh, this could be a good investment uh, because X, Y, Z. What are those X, Y, Z elements uh, for you, your top of mind things? 
Okay, so th the first thing is that sometimes it's more subtle, uh, subtle, uh, or sometimes it's more, I would say, organized. But in the in the, the end of the day, if you know uh, an industry very well, a sector very well, you know the players, you know the incentives, and when someone proposes an idea, you see how that idea sits within this, you know, these incentives on the market, or with these market dynamics. And I think that's the first thing that you can understand. So I'll just get another uh, another example. The company is actually in Rio, uh, and this company um, it created a digital version or a digital platform for um, uh, beauty clinics. So they they do aesthetic procedures, Botox and stuff like that, and. Uh, and people love to, to, you know, to purchase those services on those products. However, they have to, you know, research about a doctor. This doctor has no online store. So sometimes you just want to uh, get their services, but you can't because, you know, regulation kind of uh, prevents you from, from buying online, something like that. Unless you're a platform and you do that as a platform. So in the end of the day, you can amass lots of people. And uh, those people, uh, for example, those people can, um, you, you're going to have a very good TPV or total processed value uh, under the, the, the platform. And with this TPV, you can enable other businesses. So in the end of the day, it's more like you, you can see, you know, the, the function, the first derivative and the second derivative and the third and the fourth because you have seen business similar business down the road and the only thing that you have to make sure is that they actually implement everything they want because it's very easy to lose you know uh, lose track and not implement everything that's actually going to unlock your value down the road so make sure that the company makes it to the last part yeah, and, and, you, and you said you talk about derivatives and like faces in a sense. Exactly. How do, you, how do you keep focus in a company? How do you, you know, avoid looking for, oh, the, the other thing or the, oh, this opportunity there and so on? How do you, how do you keep on track? Well, in the end of the day, you have to understand a few things. For example, if a company that goes, uh, happens to, you happen to meet this person, the person is amazing, the company seems amazing, everything, but that's a market that you don't understand very well. And you're trying to see all those derivatives and everything that's happening and you can't see. Actually, remember the gut feeling. That's a feeling that you say, hey, how much value can I really add here? The first thing you have to understand is that sometimes if you give me time, I will find value, which is okay. And uh, I will just, you know, turn on my McKinsey switch and I uh, start, you know, understanding things or, you know, the IB switch and, you know, and that that's going to help a lot, but it's going to take time. And sometimes for you to take time, you, you I either need to be a, a advisor for the company for a long time or you, you got to be an investor of the company for for some time, too. So in the end of the day, you have to spend time. So and uh, if you have the time to do that, OK. But sometimes you already have one company or two or three that you are spending time to understand. And then another opportunity like that comes up. We just have to say no. And, and then sometimes they say, hey, I can't now. OK, but uh, I, I'm really interested by the, the company. But it just you, you just can't uh, process any, any, anymore. And then that's one thing. However, most of the companies you can understand really quickly if it interests you or not. And sometimes it's uh, it's not about the company itself, but it's more about the opportunity. And I call opportunity its market, its company, its founder, its timing, and uh, make sure that they are aligned. Good co good company in a bad timing is terrible. Yeah, and and, and something something some investor have have told me is that, I mean, some some people say this, some others don't, but that after a couple of months, three four five months of investing in a company, you realize if it's going to do well or not. And I've gotten some pushback from that. And I wonder what's your perspective in this? Is there, is there a way to kind of like anticipate the outcome of companies once you've gotten to see behind the, I guess, behind the curtains and, and, and the backstage of the company once invested? 
uh, I don't think that's actually true, to be honest. There's one company that's doing awesome in my portfolio. Uh, it's a lending company for class CDNE. It's called Jeito. It almost went broke like a few times. That's a great and, name, by the way. Yeah, and then now it's, it's doing great. Uh, and the company is growing well, has more than three to four million clients. When I entered the company as their advisor and uh, an investor, uh, 2017 ish, the company has five five thousand clients. So that's a huge uh, leap. There's another company that I I, I liked a lot, and uh, the company went broke, and and I managed to make five times on my investment on this company. And why is that? Exactly. Why is that? Because everybody was bullish on the company. And I said, well, I might make some money here and keep the optionality. And that was key because the company was valued at 30 times. And then we made up a partial exit. It's, it's, uh, you, you don't know. And some people were really bullish, but you know, change dynamics. Every, every single investor that comes in the company, you know, can grow or not. That's one thing. Uh, that I, I, momentum I'm is that comes and goes. Yeah, but I'm interested in the in the first case in the company that you know almost went bust and then ended up doing well or is doing well, I guess, at the moment. And was there anything particular that changed? Was it the market? Was it the founders that kind of like found their way through? Uh, what happened? Yeah. That that specific company, I would say the 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 key point is called resilience, because you know the the main founder and he's amazing. He's one of the best risk uh, credit risk guys that I that I'm uh, that I know, and this guy was very resilient, and he he put his assets on the line, he's put his uh, career and uh, his reputation on the line several times. And uh, in the end of the day, he said, I will do that yes or yes. And uh, even though I don't have the best, you know, tools at my options, because, you know, people don't see me as the, you know, uh, as the top dog or something investable because I don't have, you know, this clout, but I will prove that I will bury, not, he didn't say that, but he said that I'll prove that I'll, I'll, I'll go longer than anyone. And to be honest, out of those, you know, wave of, of uh, FinTech or lending companies from the late uh, 2000 uh, teens, so 2015, uh, 15, 16, whatever, uh, just a few of them are alive and just even less are profitable. And those, this company managed to become profitable, managed to become a, to, to be alive and kicking. So that's the thing. They're gonna reach probably close to a billion AIs in revenue or, or 200 million USD in revenue. That's pretty much, and uh, it's pretty big actually. Yeah, so some people talk about cockroaches, like companies that are cockroaches that never die. Uh, mm. There's times to be a cockroach and times to be an, a unicorn, right? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, this uh, VC bestiary, there's a very nice uh, article about that. It's called the VC bestiary. And uh, it, they talk about cockroaches, camels, unicorns, dragons. Uh, um, I remember the other medical chimera. And you know, th there are many other companies. But the one I like is the dragons because they, they raise from one to ten times. And they do that every time. So if, if you actually raise the dragons, like one after the other, your funds are going to be much better than trying to raise, you know, unicorns because unicorns, they, they lose their horn and they become bust. Uh, dragons, they, they go from zero and then invest a company, you know, low multiples, but, uh, the company keep growing like 30, 40, 20% every single year every single year and then the compounded power you know that very well after five years growing 30 30 percent a year you're doing great uh even though the company is as I, as we spoke in the beginning the company becomes stable and growing so you you have a company that's that that is growing now will grow in the future and have you know the stability to if something happens they will not they will not die so 
that's the kind of animal that I like. That's good. And we've talked a little bit about uh, the state of VC in, in the region, the state of VC in the world, also in Brazil. Uh, how, how do you see it right now? Uh, like, what's, what's your take on fundraising uh, from LPs? You know, interest rates are high, especially in Brazil uh, with the CDIs and so on. <laughs> I, I say that our, our biggest competitor is called, you know, Central Bank. Not Central Bank, but, uh, you, you know, the interest rates, basic interest rates, Selic, which is the main uh, driver for CDI. And they, if, you're, if, you're, if you have money and you're a smart investor, you can get 15% with very low risk a year, locked up for at least three years. So having 15% a year, it's not that, you know, not that bad, but, uh, that, but that's in Brazilian reais. And how about that in dollar? So you, you got to understand a little bit more about that. And, uh, another thing, uh, this is microeconomic. You should be sending your money to a strong currency and, uh, Brazilian, uh, individuals, LPs, they tend to have a very strong domestic bias. Normally in US, for example, which has the highest, um, I would say domestic bias. Domestic bias is when you invest mostly on the country you live rather than where you should. But uh, according to, with the GDP and the size of the companies, you should be investing around 60% in the US and 40% everywhere, everywhere else in the world. Uh, because uh, U.S. economy, they actually represents many of the economies of the other countries. So that's why they have a very this very heavy, you know, um, uh, set up on the portfolio. But Brazilians they invest ninety eight percent in Brazil. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. And whatever they have outside, sometimes is that spending money or they have something somebody made them buy so some a little bit you know a, a us dollars fund or something like that and uh you as a as a if you have your income a source in brazil you send your money abroad and then you keep them there as investment that's really good for you really good because you're taking a lot of risk out of the table of course you have to invest a little bit in brazil uh but do like 50 percent not nine, not not ninety eight, and uh, or 40% or something like that. And even though if you invest in Brazil through US, depending on the fund structure, you are much better. Um, sometimes it is, you know, tax efficiency. But the other thing that's really nice is that uh, when you invest, for example, in a VC fund that's domiciled outside Brazil, uh, you don't have exchange rate, you don't, don't have exchange risk. That's amazing. You only have upsides, not only, but you know, if the exchange goes on your way, it means that uh, it's getting more Brazilian reais is getting less expensive, um, which means that even if the company doubles in Brazilian reais, they will not double in the U.S. And what's going to happen? Success fee for the managers is going to be lower. So you get on that. So you're you're making. Uh, so that that's a good point for you. If the, the, the market goes the other way, you know, even though the company uh, delivers the same price or same entry price, you're going to pay some success fee because it's in USD. But if you are in Brazilian highs in the end of the day, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, value generation, you don't feel it because you send highs abroad. When you get money, you get highs in back. So if the dollar went like from one to 10, you're just gonna you're just gonna have less usd but reais wise is just gonna be the same so that, that's a way for you to actually protect yourself and uh invest in this risky category with the with at the expense of the manager i would say that's a, yeah, that's a good so way because in the end of the day the dollar is gonna go up so yeah and you have a double you have a double challenge then because you have to convince people of investing in a, in a US based fund, right? And, and also conv convince them of investing in yours. Right? Oh, yes. Oh, in, t in terms of uh, our it's challenge, good. if it's, it's a Brazilian LP, I have to convince them invest in the US 
and invest in a VC. But actually, US is more like, you know, when you go to the operational part of the, you know, the, the sales cycle. And uh, the thing is that when you're talking to a US investor or European based investor, you have to say, hey, you're going to invest in the US, but the underlying asset is in Latin America and in Brazil. So in the end of the day, you just uh, um, invest in a in emerging market. And unlike Brazilians, they don't, don't they don't see that you know benefit of uh, of uh, the hedge benefit because they already are, are are based on the strong currency region. So it's yeah. for them it's different. That makes sense. Edu, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, I was thinking that in Argentina, it's it's quite the opposite. I think it's ninety eight percent of the money outside of Argentina and two percent inside. <laughs> But anyway, maybe you could fundraise here. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, wishing you the best uh, for Urban Ventures and for yourself. And hopefully we'll see each other soon enough. No, it was a pleasure to talk to you, Nacho. And uh, I hope everybody likes that, that conversation. Yeah, hopefully. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on Spotify and YouTube. Give us a like. Give us a nice review if you liked it. Also, follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. You can find us as Draper Startup House, Draper House Latin, and so on. If you want to partner with us, reach out at irepa at draperstartuphouse.com. That is I-R-E-P-A at draperstartuphouse.com. See you on our next episode, wishing you the best of growth and remember to enjoy the ride.